J'appelle maintenant euh, Madame Elena Badea à la tribune. Madame Badea qui est euh, de l'université de Craiova en Roumanie euh, où elle est professeure euh, en biochimie à la faculté des sciences. Elle travaille depuis 2002 euh, avec l'université de Turin sur euh, les documents euh, composés de collagène, donc euh, essentiellement sur le, le parchemin. Et elle va nous présenter euh, les recherches qu'elle mène actuellement euh, sur, euh, la, la, à la recherche plutôt d'un système euh, de contrôle du climat pour une conservation optimale euh, des parchemins dont nous savons qu'ils sont extrêmement sensibles euh, aux conditions environnementales. Merci, Madame. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to give a talk about the uh, identification of environmentally sensitive parchment and also leather for, um, let's say, a lower energy storage. We know some people working with parchment and leather uh, knows that both these materials are classified as sensitive and um, as a consequence the um, standards, the, te the temperature and relative humidity uh, standard values for their preservation are very tight. Um, this means um, higher costs for preservation and um, um, a step for a world to successfully relate the longevity of, co of collections and preservation cost is a, a deep knowledge of uh, materials response to temperature and relative humidity. Um, let me mention that this is a collaborative uh, work and um, that was um, performed within um, a few projects starting since 2002. Um, the effect of uh, environmental factors as uh, temperature, relative humidity, uh, visible light and um, air pollutants uh, were studied in uh, the European project improved damage assessment of parchments and the tools and protocols that were delivered in this project were then applied to survey the properties of a number of parchments and leather collections in, um, from uh, Italian and Romanian archives, libraries and museums. And uh, our current uh, objectives is now to develop intelligent system for analysis and uh, diagnosis of collagen-based artifacts. Um, <clears throat> both parchment and leather are outstanding materials in terms of their resilience and strength against time and environment. They passed through centuries and um, we still uh, have um, many thousands of documents, uh, manuscripts, uh, and uh, leather objects in our museums and uh, libraries, happily. Uh, they are, however, subject to deterioration caused by external factors like environment, natural events as floods, fire, um, earthquakes, and so on. And also human action can be uh, uh, damaging of course, we have also to take into, into consideration the technology of fabrication, especially in the case of leather. Uh, the main deterioration mechanism for both these materials are hydrolysis and oxidation, as well as molecular denaturation. The molecular denaturation and its uh, final irreversible step, gelatinizations, are generally produced by advanced oxidation or and hydrolysis or by their synergetic effects. Here are some examples of severe deterioration of parchment and leather objects. It is very, how to say, uh, obvious, so the damage is uh, visible, extremely visible, but uh, because we have, in general, for these materials, as as for other uh, heritage materials, damage 
proceeds in a progressive way from the outside towards inside and from the macroscopic structures towards the molecular ones. Um, however, I, it should be stressed that in many cases, uh, damage may remain, may remain invisible while the internal structures of parchment or leather have been already weakened or even damaged. So, um, as the surface is frequently carrying inscriptions and illuminations, it is important that both surface and the underlying layers of parchment on leather be assessed. Um, here you can see an example of a, a parchment surface with a, a glassy-like um, surface layer and beneath the fibers in a quite good conditions. So, in the project that I mentioned before, we set up um, a number of protocols for quantifying and also for describing damage in, um, on surface and on bulk materials. And um, some of them, like um, non-contact infrared, uh, ATR, uh, FTIR infrared uh, spectroscopy and unilateral magnetic resonance are fully non-invasive and non-destructive. Uh, others, like micro-hot table method um, and differential scanning calorimetry, requires uh, a minimum quantity of samples, uh, a few fibers in the case of MHT and more or less one milligram in the case of micro-DSC. And, um, of course, scanning electron microscopy, you know that it is non-invasive, but um, not destructive, but can be invasive. And uh, also, we can perform uh, infrared spectroscopy in an invasive way uh, in order to obtain quantitative uh, uh, information. Another critical uh, aspect of um, how to say, setting up a um, scientific approach to assess uh, parchment and leather it, um, is concerned with the structure of collagen. Both parchment and leather are mainly comprised of collagen. Collagen is a protein characterized by a hierarchical structure um, in which um, the various structural levels uh, interact uh, uh, each other. Uh, so, uh, all of these structural levels uh, from the molecule, starting from the molecule to the microfibers, fibers, and to the uh, tissue, to the uh, network uh, fibers of the tissue, should be uh, accounted for the, um, reliable assessment of uh, damage in these materials. Uh, another critical point is that we should always consider these materials as heterogeneous materials. Um, generally, we are used to, um, to see um, gelatin um, uh, because uh, um, this glossy surface, it is rather frequent on uh, uh, historical documents on all, and also shrinkage, extensive shrinkage um, is uh, not uncommon for bindings and even single sheets. Here are two examples for the um, uh, historical archives of the city of Turin. Uh, this, we studied these two collect collections of single sheets and book bindings. Uh, they were stored starting from 1999 until the end of the last century in, um, on metal shelves in heated room in the city council palace. And um, we are, a question arises uh, naturally if this uh, kind of, uh, how to say, uh, um, storage uh, maybe was uh, or contributed to the damaging uh, condition of these uh, uh, objects. 
This is a particular and extreme uh, situation. These are the parchment manuscripts uh, that were uh, burned in the fire uh, of 1904 at the National Library, uh, University Library in Turin. Uh, here there was uh, the fire action plus uh, the formaldehyde action that was, uh, um, how to say, used to avoid the rapid decay of the manuscripts that was, were burnt and then uh, water used for fire extinction. Um, okay, um, let's, uh, before um, uh, starting to uh, speak about denaturation, let's um, try to explain what means collagen denaturation. We, for all of us, are very familiar with the macroscopic manifestation of this phenomenon. So uh, it appears proteins are subjected to denaturation uh, as a, a consequence of mechanical, uh, chemical, or thermal uh, action. Um, in reality, this, uh, uh, this phenomenon is, has a molecular basis. In the case of collagen, the molecule, which is a triple helix, starts under mechanical, chemical, or thermal ac action to lose uh, its uh, tridimensional conformation. And then uh, the alpha chains uh, unwind. And uh, finally, uh, they lose also the helical conformation and convert in an irreversible way to random coil um, conformation. And this conformation is gelatin. OK, one of the best ways to assess this phenomenon, this process, is uh, differential scanning calorimetry. So this is um, a technique uh, used for assessing protein denaturation. And um, it, uh, the advantage of, of such a technique is is that, uh, that we obtain not only qualitative, but especially quantitative information. So uh, in few words, in a calorimeter, a sample is heated on a constant rate. And uh, when denaturation, thermal denaturation in this case, which is induced by heating occurs, a peak is registered. And uh, the features of this peak are directly related to the quality of the protein in the material analyzed. Here you can see the denaturation of a new parchment uh, compared to the denaturation of a new leather. Uh, the peak of the leather of, is much narrower, and uh, the temperature of denaturation is higher, and this is obviously due to the chemical cross-linking uh, induced by tanning. Uh, these are very, two very fine examples because, as I told you, both parchment and uh, leather are heterogeneous, and uh, also the new materials can have an intrinsic hetero heterogeneous uh, uh, heterogeneity provoked by the fabrication technology uh, or by the quality of the fabrication technology. And, um, these are the denaturation peaks for, histo for some examples, for historical parchments. If we decompose a peak, we can see that there are distinct collagen population which denaturate at a different temperature, okay? And this depends on the structure of this uh, collagen population and, uh, uh, of course, on the level of deterioration of uh, the materials. Um, moreover, in, we, uh, in this case, we can also quantify the various collagen populations by measuring the peak area of each of these peaks. Uh, also, gelatin can be detected and quantified. The same in the case of leathers. 
also letters, historical letters presents a very high level of heterogeneity. And, oh, sorry. So, uh, the problem is that uh, being so heterogeneous, these materials will react with uh, all these uh, components of collagen and parchment will react differently to various temperature and relative humidity conditions. So, in order to um, evaluate uh, the response of this collagen population to temperature and relative humidity, we perform uh, many um, accelerated aging uh, treatments. Here is one example, a series of parchments that were exposed to 80 degrees Celsius and alternate relative humidity 40 and 80 degree, 80 percent in alternate days, and you can see that the shape of the peak and obviously the parameters characterizing these peaks uh, changes dramatically uh, on increasing time. Uh, also, the gelatin is formed. You can see here in the zoomed area. Um, okay. This is a typical peak for a new parchment. As I told you, also new parchments present at least two or three uh, collagen populations. Main, the main collagen population we called native collagen population. This is the stabilized collagen population and the presence of these two collagen population is mainly due to the fabrication technology and also a less stable collagen population. So how this collagen population behave during aging, you can see in this figure. And the temperature of the peak, of the main peak, native collagen, tends to decrease. The same, the temperature of the unstable collagen decreases. Only the temperature of the stabilized collagen tends to withstand uh, deterioration in these conditions. If we quantify this collagen population, we see that the native collagen in pink decreases, while the unstable green and gelatin fractions increases. Also, there is a decrease of the total collagen population, uh, so a part of this collagen transform, convert in a non-reactive, so we cannot, we can no longer detect this kind of collagen in a very high deterioration state by this technique. So, if we consider the peak, uh, peak parameters um, and the, which are uh, maximum temperature, height of the peak and half width of the peak, and plot uh, all uh, the samples treated at 100 degrees, 80 degrees, 60 and 40, independently of the relative humidity, we've observed that samples group. So all samples age at, for example, at 80 degrees Celsius, fall in this area and so on. This small rectangle dashed rectangle is the area where an exposed parchment fall. Then, plotting the historical parchment, um, surprising uh, observation came out that historical parchments also tend to group depending on their provenance, that means on their conservation history. For example, um, bindings from the historical archives of Turin are more or less grouped in the same area or where parchment aged at 40 degrees Celsius group. So this is a very, uh, a very nice information. Another observation, which is also very important, is that uh, the natural environment deterioration generally produce this kind of, how to say, of trend. That means the uh, moving of peaks towards higher temperature. That is, uh, collagen 
aging, when aging, the tendency of collagen is to stabilize itself. Of course, some part of collagen becomes gelatin and other part of collagen deteriorate in an irreversible way, so we cannot, we cannot longer detect in uh, using this uh, uh, using micro DSC, but we can quantify um, this uh, collagen by taking into account uh, the references. Um, in, in some cases, especially when uh, uh, conservation and restoration treatments or how to say um, catastrophic events such as fluids happened, there is a second pattern uh, like this parchments, uh, SC-164 and SC-168 are, were uh, flooded in Florence in 1968 and SC-32 was um, treated and we know for sure that water was used and then was, um, how to say, uh, dried by heating. Uh, so, uh, we can uh, say that uh, parchments has uh, a group uh, can be classified in these two groups, uh, stabilized parchments where the contribution of the stabilized collagen is higher than 50% and these parchments as you saw in a previous uh, slide uh, have the tendency to withstand um, temperature, uh, higher values of temperature and relative humidity as well as uh, relative humidity fluctuations uh, while the other group of parchments uh, where the, the most significant contribution comes from the unstable and gelatin, unstable collagen and pre-gelatin and gelatin uh, are highly susceptible to environmental aging as they, as you, as you can see from their temperature, they can collapse at room temperature and uh, especially when humidity, when in moist condition. Um, okay, so um, another, um, another criteria which is very important when assess the stability of collagen is the presence of gelatin and pre-gelatinized areas. Um, the problem is uh, okay, micro DSC is an excellent tool. Uh, we can um, do all uh, this, kind, this kind of studies. However, uh, the instrument is, ex is expensive, the operator need, uh, operator need highly training, and it is difficult, in my opinion, it is hardly that such an instrument could enter a conservation laboratory. So uh, generally, uh, conservators are looking for, uh, how to say, portable, uh, non-invasive uh, uh, instruments, and one solution could be given uh, by the unilateral uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. Even in this case, we can individuate uh, partial denaturation, denaturation, gelatinization, and hydrolysis. In case of, hydroly in case of gelatinization, you can see the two um, uh, bindings here, we can find the gelatin by micro DSC and also by SEM, by scanning electron microscopy, we can see the glassy-like glassy -like surfaces. Uh, and however, also nuclear magnetic resonance is an expensive technique, uh, the operator needs high training and um, um, the problem, the, the challenge is to develop a method uh, that can be used, easily used in a conservation laboratory, non micro-invasive or non-invasive, and also portable. And uh, uh, people you um, used to study parchment and leather knows that the probably the most widely used method for characterizing parchment and leather is the micro-hot micro -hot table method. Generally, um, with these techniques, uh, shrinkage temperature is measured. Shrinkage is a phenomenon which it is the, the by shrinkage, we, uh, we, we, how to say, uh, cold shrinkage, the macroscopic manifestation of molecular denaturation. And I will, I hope, 
to be able to start yes the, the movie shrinkage in few words is the uh, how to say the motion of the collagen fibers subjected to uh, heating to uh, heating under constant rate um, you will see that at a certain point the fiber starts to move and um, shrinks they shrink and also move uh, the fiber motion will continue for a, for a while uh, this uh, activity uh, was divided in five intervals uh, called A1, B1, C, and uh, A, B2, and, two, and A2. These intervals are um, individuated based on the um, uh, features of the, mo of the fiber motions. And um, here you can see three examples of um, shrinkage activity for three... Okay, three uh, rolls, parchment rolls from the State Archives of, of Turin. And uh, you can see that uh, in the same collection we, can, we have very, very different uh, behavior. Um, the one one sample uh, show a very high shrinkage activity uh, that, and um, based on this shrinkage activity and other temperatures, uh, measured, uh, we can say that this is a damaged and very unstable sample and uh, with a very high heterogeneity level. For the 2-1 two, two samples, yes, also this is damaged but it is very stable and show very low heterogeneity, while the last, the 5.3 sample, is not damaged at all, very stable and low heterogeneity. Okay. Um, this is the correlation that we found between uh, uh, gelatinization. This is a, ca a study case. So uh, parchments that were uh, studied using all methods I mentioned before. And we can see that the gelatinization we found by uh, nuclear magnetic resonance was also found by sh uh, measuring shrinkage activity. And uh, um, as I told you, the challenge now is to develop a system for the analysis and diagnosis of collagen-based artifacts, and this means that uh, the development of an automated measurement system based on a software application that implements the motion detection algorithms for tracking and measuring shrinkage intervals, controls the heating plate and the um, image cap capturing devices. This is uh, preliminary results, a comparison between the shrinkage temperature measured by an operator and by image processing, and uh, we obtained an absolute error of optical flow estimation of about 1.1 degrees Celsius, and the error of an operator uh, measurement is about 2-3 degrees Celsius. And uh, the correlation analysis between the various temperatures measured by MHT and microDSE is expected to enhance the content of information provided by the MHT and will allow us to develop a dedicated software for computer-aided diagnosis. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. It was very interesting. We, I, I just have a short question uh, would you s is it possible that um, in the same uh, repository um, you you found uh, some uh, very different natures of collagen as you explained as you explained is it possible that uh, for instance the provenance of the parchment was different or would the parchment come from the same provenance and then what would explain this uh, major difference in the collagen nature? Uh, could be different exposure, for example, bindings. You know, the external cover mm -hmm. behave in one way, the f internal flaps in another way. Or, you know, the sheets inside the manuscript. So you can have a different uh, degree of deterioration and also different stability uh, looking at the sheets of 
one manuscripts, the first one, or, or even if you look at the, how to say, uh, the corner when you turn on the page, and uh, also with roles, and with roles, of course, the problem is that roles were um, uh, built up uh, uh, during years, so you know, pieces were added during um, tens or even hundred years, so the provenance uh, could be uh, um, uh, an explanation for this kind of uh, differences. Thank you very much.